and hello to you and welcome to the Richard Nichols podcast, the personal development podcast series that's here to help inspire, educate and motivate you to be the best you can be. I'm psychotherapist Richard Nichols and this is episode 159. It's titled Resilience and if you're ready, we'll start the show. Hey there, pod fans. I'll call you pod fans because I assume you found me because you like listening to podcasts rather than finding me first and podcasts afterwards. And if you are a podcast fanatic, then feel free to register with the People's Choice Podcast Awards at podcastawards.com. They're looking for listeners to nominate their favourite podcasts. And I'm nominated in the health category. I've added a link on the webpage. If you go to motivateyourself.co.uk, you'll see a link to register yourself as a listener. And you can nominate me as one of your favourites, if you like. If I am, that is. I hope I am. Please like me. Anyway, (laughs) how insecure was that? How's your month been? Good, I hope. I'm in one of those funny positions as a therapist in that if everyone was fine, I'd be out of a job. But that's not so bad, I guess. Unfortunately, it's probably never going to happen because, well, that's just not how the brain works, is it? Our ability to think, whether that's about the past or the future, is a great achievement in evolution. But that cognitive ability comes at a huge emotional cost. It's generally believed that there was a change in our human history around 700,000 years ago with a species known as Homo heidelbergensis. These were the ancestors of both us and Neanderthals, ancient ones, and seem to be the first of our kind to have developed a brain that's as big as ours. And this was great for them because they were able to begin working together and create that sort of herd mentality that we still have today. There's definitely safety in numbers when you live on an African savanna and need to fight off saber-toothed tigers. And I wonder if it was here that we started to be able to separate our emotions. Maybe prior to that, all we had was fear. A feeling that something wasn't quite right, which led to the anxiety response that made us run back to our cave. But having more cognitive ability means we can then feel rejection, envy and foreboding. It does make me wonder, uh, no matter what uh, or when, at some point, we began to grow the ability to think about the future. Probably starting by chucking a rock at a duck or something. Being able to work out where the duck is going to be in two seconds' time and throwing the rock there instead of where it is right now would have meant that some smart old Homo heidelbergensis got more meat than his slightly dimmer living-in-the-moment cousin. Now, I'm all for living in the moment, but there's a time and a place for it. We've probably all met someone who seems to never have a care in the world, they just seem to take everything in their stride, and they don't seem to get phased by anything. And often, though, that person's a bit of a pain in the backside, because they're always late for appointments and things. Maybe they've got a genetic mutation. Maybe they're a throwback from a million years ago. Maybe it's nurture rather than nature. Who knows? Either way, they don't have enough negative emotion to give them a jolt and get them doing something i was thinking i was reminded of this uh last week my son was talking about this the other day he's 13 and he's kind of getting ready for his gcses next year and he takes his school relatively seriously he's always getting commendations and he seems way smarter than i was when i was at his well when i was his age he's been nominated for an award at a progress evening next week at his school and i'm super proud Mostly because he's found the balance between too little worry and too much worry. And I think I probably know why. Probably, yeah, is, that, is it going to be nurture rather than nature? Because it's, I think it's probably nurture here. I've always taught him that the education system is just a game we all have to play in order to prove ourselves to other people, as well as to figure out our own strengths and weaknesses. The school is there to work out what we're passionate and enthusiastic about and what we're really not interested in. And if we don't have these experiences and lessons, then we don't know. Which is probably not the answer that kids want when they say, what's the point in learning this? This is never going to come up in my life ever again. And I hear that maths teachers get told that all the time. What's the point, miss? I'm never going to be able to do I'm never going to need this ever again in my life. You are, no, that's not the point. <laughs> You don't know that you're not interested in it until you have a go at it. That's just 
that's just how it works, isn't it? Anyway, when he started high school, he kind of came, continued with um, that sort of laissez-faire attitude that kids have when they're at junior school, you know. Yeah, well, I'll do my homework tomorrow. It's not due in for a few days yet anyway. And the thing is, when you get into high school, the homework starts getting bigger, doesn't it? And there was one bit of homework he had that took way longer than he thought it was going to. He'd been working on it for a few hours and it's still not finished at seven o'clock one night when it's due in the next day. And he panicked. He got angry with himself, he rushed it and wasn't particularly proud of what he'd done. And he never made that mistake again. And since then, since having that little bit of a panic... He's then set himself daily goals of what he wants to achieve, including setting time restraints on all the YouTube videos he wants to watch and how much Fortnite he's going to play. He gets all his homework in on time and still has time to chill before going to bed. But he's got a friend who thinks very differently. He's got a mate who doesn't feel any pressure, doesn't get stressed. Because of this, he forgets to do his homework. And he rushes it in the morning, he does it quickly, or at the last minute he hands it in late... Whenever he does it, it's done without any great fuss, without any anxiety, even if it's late and he's doing it before he walks into school. It's no, there's, no, there's no pressure to it. He doesn't mind that he's having to do that. And if it's substandard work, he doesn't really care. He knows he can do better and he doesn't mind if the teachers don't see that right now. He's fine. And I'm kind of envious of that sort of attitude. But it doesn't work for me. And the main reason these podcasts come out on the first of every month is because I know that if they were just, oh, as and when, whenever, then I'll probably procrastinate and they'd only be about five or six a year. If it gets too close to the end of the month and I don't know what topic I'm going to be doing next, I'm going to panic a bit and that's going to stop me being in any way creative. I I don't like that feeling of panic. Like my son with that first bit of homework that spurred him on to act differently... I've had similar experiences. But without the stress, without the panic, we've got nothing to spur us on. I was on a training course many years ago now, well, maybe 10, 11 years ago, something like that. And for whatever reason, I wasn't aware that I was supposed to be doing some sort of presentation. A 30-minute presentation that wasn't really connected with what that week-long training was about. It was just to prove competence at presenting something to do with psychotherapy. If I was told about it, I totally forgot. But I don't think I was told. Anyway, my wife says, I'm sure you probably were, Richard. You just probably weren't listening. No, this is really important. I'd have have, have known. There was nothing in my emails. But anyway, I don't think I was told. So, sitting in a cafe around the corner from the training venue, having breakfast with a couple of the other delegates, one of the guys I'm with, who are new, he asks what we're all planning to do for our presentations, because... When he'd asked the tutors the day before, they'd said that they might ask some people to do theirs that day. And I'm floored, because I don't know anything about this. And maybe later that day, I'm going to do a presentation. What the hell am I going to talk about for 30 minutes? Anyway, I did get pulled up. Come on, Richard, your turn. Oh, God. Anyway, it was an absolute disaster. Absolute disaster. I was practically ridiculed by this guy for just making something up as I was going along, which with hindsight, really shouldn't have been how I introduced the presentation. Hello, so I'm Richard, and I'm just going to free-flow this presentation. I've not really prepared anything whatsoever, so feel free to jump in and ask me questions any time you like. To which he answered with, Are you serious, Rich? Do you really think you can just blag this? And I was interrupted every couple of minutes with some nasty, snide comment. It was quite bullying, really. Anyway, it was painful. It hurt. It really did hurt. And I had a bit of a go at him. Well, I say I've, I had a bit of a go. Uh, as much of a go at somebody as I do the next time I saw him because we worked together on a committee. Anyway, following that, the next time I'm on a training course, as therapists have to do a, a lot of continuing development, you see, we're, I was asked again to prepare a presentation and I'm properly on the ball. Properly on the ball. We get told about it on the Monday. We're told we'll be doing some sort of presentation on the Friday that week. And I'm phoning my wife from the hotel on the Monday night, asking her to go through a book that I know is on my shelf at home and photographing certain pages to email me for me to make sure I've got all my facts right that I want to present. Maybe I was overthinking a bit. I think I did put a bit too much work into it. But it ended up being a a really good presentation and I was very happy with it. The pain of the presentation from the previous year influenced me to put some extra effort into the next one. Without that painful experience, 
without the stress, the anxiety and maybe shame, I probably would have just done the bare minimum to prove competence and not feel much positive emotion about it at all. The pain was useful to me. My brain said, that was bad, don't do it again. Now, in another universe, if these things really do exist, there's a version of me that answered that statement with, quite right, never again, no more training courses for me, I always knew I was an imposter, and now I've been found out, it's time to face reality, Richard, get back under your rock where you came from. But I didn't. Instead, I answered that voice with, there's a lesson there. If you learn from it, you can do better next time. But if I hadn't have processed that experience that I had, that nasty experience at the training course on the train journey back to Nuneaton, I could so easily have just reacted emotionally rather than cognitively. I could have took a back seat in my own life rather than actually drive it because although we have to attend these continuing professional development events every year, They don't have to be things that are certificated. They don't have to come with an extra qualification that you do a presentation for and stuff. I could have just chosen from that point on to simply attend lectures, like most people. Sit at the back, keep my head down and walk away afterwards with a certificate of attendance rather than anything else. Because, believe me, that little boy inside of me wanted to live that way. But it wouldn't have helped me with my end goal which was to get better at what I did until I felt comfortable enough in my own skin to do things like this podcast and present at conferences like I did earlier on in the month at the International Hypnopsychotherapy Conference, which uh, some of you might might have seen on social media. I've got lots of comments about it. Thank you. I didn't realise so many people actually do. Um, It's one thing to add me as a... um, Follow me on Instagram or Twitter or or, or Facebook or whatever. One thing to follow me. It's another thing for me to see. Oh, you actually see these things then. Oh, oh, crikey. And I got lots of comments about it. I was dressed up. It was smart. It was a really nice event. Uh, So thank you for all of that. Um, So I was lucky enough to bounce back from that experience that I had back 10, 11 years ago. But not everyone is. Maybe being a therapist helped. But not everyone's a therapist, having had to go through 48 sessions of private therapy just to qualify. So what makes us resilient from that? What makes us bounce back? What makes us grow that resilience and how can we boost it? Well, I see resilience as a mixture of a few traits. Firstly, the perspective that failure is normal, that it helps us to learn. Secondly, emotional intelligence, being able to see the difference between feeling rejected and feeling angry, for example. And thirdly, being an optimistic realist. So let's look at these. Failure is normal then. So the issue with this is that as adults, we have far more going on in our head than we did when we were nine months old and learning to walk. I've said this quite a few times, but as a child, we don't hold ourselves back. If we fall over as a toddler, we don't have the cognitive ability to tell ourselves how useless we are. We just try again and probably fall over again, and so we try again and again and keep falling over until eventually we're walking, running, and jumping all over the shop. As adults, when we see evidence that we can't do something very well, we need to catch ourselves before we start slagging ourselves off. But it takes deliberate practice for that attitude to become second nature, and an acceptance of the process of learning, that getting something wrong is just a part of it. It's a part of learning how to get it right. And that's the same for learning to play the guitar as it is for learning how to be a grown-up, how to be a dad, how to just be. How to handle adversity and be able to simply take a deep breath and move on from it. Which brings me on to the next bit. Emotional intelligence. Never underestimate the influence that your emotion has on your body and vice versa. When your brain sees that something unexpected has happened, when we get a signal that says our expectations have not been met, we will get a fight or flight response. It happens when we're nicely surprised and it happens when things don't go our way. The only difference is the way we process it in our mind. So if being excited and being anxious are pretty much exactly the same chemical and physiological changes, only with a different cognition that either makes us feel that we can accept it in which case we just feel it and we're okay, or that it's unacceptable, in which case we feel it and it gets worse and worse with every thought we have, then the thinking is the problem. So it's important to practice thinking differently 
about the response that unpleasant experiences gives you. That starts by taking as much control as you can. Remember what I said, never underestimate the influence that emotion has on your body and vice versa. Your body will help you to influence your emotions. When stressed out, the fight or flight response is looking for oxygen. It wants you to either fight the saber-toothed tiger or hide in your cave. And to do that, it diverts blood flow from unimportant places like your stomach and squirts adrenaline into your bloodstream to get what oxygen you've got moving to where it's needed. And that's why we always say, take a deep breath, a proper deep breath, from the bottom of your lungs, pushing your stomach out on the in-breath, holding for a few seconds and breathing out slowly. Swapping carbon dioxide for oxygen and breathing in again, deeply. And then you do it again. And then again, if you have to, your brain gets a signal that there's no need for adrenaline, that you've got enough oxygen in your muscles to fight or flee if you have to. And anyway, the threat must have gone now because you've stopped thinking about running away because you're too busy focusing on your breathing. It gives you the ability to identify why you feel the way you do. Rather than just, that has made me feel bad, you can see whether or not it's made you feel rejected, alone, jealous, angry whatever it is. With a better understanding of why you feel the way you do, you can learn from it. And learning from it builds resilience to it the next time. It allows you to bounce back. And the third thing was being an optimistic realist. I often see people in therapy who have been optimists all their life. Their glass has always been half full rather than half empty, and they've always expected good things to happen. But guess what? Life ain't always like that. Sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes our partner leaves us. Sometimes our friends reject us. All the optimism in the world won't stop our boss from restructuring a department and making us redundant. No matter what our goal is, there will be setbacks. If you plot your life on a line graph heading upwards towards whatever success means to you, it's not a straight line. It's a flipping mountain range of peaks and troughs that hopefully heads towards where you want to be. But it's all over the place like a drunk woman's makeup. So to be an optimist, but only expect things to go well, can cause people to really crash down to earth and it can be very painful. Now the opposite is to be pessimistic, to constantly say, well what if this goes wrong? And it's just as painful to live there. So if you catch yourself what ifing, rather than trying to be the optimist who argues with that inner voice and says, but what if it goes right? It can be very useful to continue the what-if-it-goes-wrong scenario onwards. Because yes, it might go wrong. But by continuing it on, you can find that eventually it doesn't matter. The realist in you can be okay with the idea of something not going the way you wanted it to, because the optimist in you can still dominate and process problems as just a part of life. Because yeah, you might not get the job you wanted because the interview didn't go as well as you wanted it to. You might have to move house because the landlord wants to turn your home into flats. But if you focus on an idea that it doesn't matter, that upsetting as difficulties can be, there'll be a time when they're just a part of your past. It eventually becomes a part of your long past. And eventually it gets forgotten. Crikey, look at the time. I've probably overrun today. So much for 15 minutes to happiness. What are we up to now? It's like 19 minutes. Yikes! Well... I'll love you and leave you, happy fans. And if you want to keep in touch, please do. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I'll put some links in the show notes too. So if you're listening via an app, you can tap the ones that you use and see my cheesy face pop pop up in your social media notifications every day or so with some annoyingly cheerful comment or two. And feel free to reply and engage in a conversation. Happy to keep in touch with you all. Anyway, gotta go. Got places to be. Have a good month and I'll see you soon. Bye.